just going back to when you started writing Tipping and all these influences and, and that you've talked about, was it an easy process to write? Because oh, as a first great. novel, it's kind of amazing to say that you'd never like had anything published before No, I'd that. never written fiction before. Not, um, not fiction anyway, so... No, it was great fun. And I had just done this, this PhD thesis, so I'd, which was a great training for writing fiction, you know, it's a lonely thing. It's <laughs> the really PhD yeah. thesis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it was a, you know, it was a lonely process. It was all about doing research and turning it into, into something of your own, and it gave me a real confidence of, about writing. Um, so, but then to be able to leave that behind, or to use some of the info I'd found in it about the naughty nineties, about about the lesbian and gay underworlds of Victorian London, to be able to use that, but make things up um, and bring things to life and. And actually fill in the gaps, because that's the thing. For history, we don't, you know, what we have for lesbian history really are just fragments and, and hints, uh, much, more, much more so than gay men, who, be because hom male homosexuality has been uh, criminalised, actually, you know, paradoxically, that's me meant it's left much more of a mark on the historical record. But lesbian um, history, of course, is much more elusive, which is frustrating for a historian, but for a historical novelist, it's actually a bit of a gift it means you can fill in the gaps. So that's what tipping was. You know, it was a fantasy. It was a fantasy history. And so it was just really good fun. Yeah, was any idea, you know, when you were writing Tipping the Velvet, that it would get optioned c so quickly, actually? Oh, God, no, I had no idea I would even get published when I was writing mm. Tipping the Velvet. I mean, I hoped I would. I, I definitely, um, I, wanted, I wanted it to be published. Um, but, but having said that, you know, I, I thought it might find a lesbian press, um, of which there were a lot around in those days. Um, and I've, I'd read a lot of lesbian fiction, like probably like lots of people here in the, in the 90s. It was part of my coming out process, reading books by Sheba and Women's Press and Only Women and Nyad books, uh, American <laughs> books. Um, you know, lots of which weren't great, but they were very <laughs> <laughs> mildly. Um, but they, uh, you know, they were romances or they were sci-fi and. Um, Sci-fi can, is, is, can be great, but you know they weren't all great. And but in a funny sort of way, that was it, well for a start. It didn't really matter. It was just tremendously exciting that they were there at all. You know, it was very political to be able to go into a bookshop or a or a library and, and find for me to find to find the lesbian and gay section. It was like it was there for me, you know, or to go into Gaze the Word or Sister Right, Silver Moon. It was tremendously exciting. Um, but because because the books were not always that great. In a funny sort of way, it was very uh, encouraging because I felt, God, you know, I can't. I, I could surely write something better than <laughs> at least than some of them. <laughs> uh, you know, with my modest ambitions, I, I really thought there's a place for me in uh, in, the, in the lesbian canon at that point. So it was very, um, actually, very liberating because if I had set out to be, I, I don't know, uh, Hilary Mantel or something, I, you know, I never would have written a word. I never would have written a word. It was it was just that I thought lesbian literature there was room for me like I say and so I, I yeah I really wanted Tipping to find a, that kind of home but that's as much as I imagined I mean I'd written Tipping the Velvet in a complete vacuum I'd just really written it for myself I didn't have a publisher or, a, or an agent lined up um, but by the time I, I, I was well underway with Affinity I, I did have an agent and a publisher sort of waiting and the idea that people would be paying money for the thing for the awful my awful prose was just paralyzing you know I just couldn't <laughs> And also, it's a, it's a rather gloomy story, and I hadn't anticipated how um, oppressive that would be to go, it's set in a women's prison, uh, Millbank, and to go back in there every day. And it has a rather, without giving anything away, it's, it's physically a very dark world, and that was very appealing, but it's also emotionally became quite a dark story too. Um, do you want to speak just a little bit more about that research you did into sp mm. spiritualism? Because I know we've chatted about it before, and then we can see we've got a clip yes. lined up, actually. Well, spiritualism, right. again, since I was a child, I've been interested in, in spiritualism and not really believing in it, but, but fascinated in it as, as a world and why people were drawn to it and still are drawn to it, of course, and what, in, what was going on for people. And one thing that really interested me about spiritualism was the potential there was in the movement for women to become very powerful, and particularly, or you know, including working class women and girls, because the thing about spirit gifts is that you know anybody might have them. So in in a, in a household, a middle class household, you as as the the mistress of the house might have spirit powers, but also your maid, your parlour maid might. You know, so there were seances held in houses in which the servants were involved. And when you look at what went on in the, in the seances, in which say 
a spirit might be materialized or might say things. Often, there were quite transgressive, quite transgressive things going on. You know, gentlemen have, having their hats knocked off and things like that. And so there were a couple of, of women, including a girl called Florence Cook from Dalston, who was just a working class girl, pretty working class girl, who got taken up by sort of male middle class uh, spiritualists. And there's a sort of fetishism in the way that, that, that women were treated sometimes because to test their powers during a seance, they were often kind of restrained, you know, and tied up and get gagged and, 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 and all sorts of kinky things like that. So uh, that intrigued me a lot. And I was interested in, well, what would happen if you had women in control of that rather than men? How far could it be pushed? And how kinky could it become, I suppose? Yeah. And I suppose with the loss of religious faith, they, w they were supplying something. And also, of course, what spiritualism has always supplied is a kind of um, alternative discourse. I don't know. I think, I suspect that his spiritualism has always been attractive to, to queer people. And, you know, certainly um, gay, gay men, I think, have, have always found a home in, in spiritualist movement because it allows men to be empathetic and gentle and, you know. Um, and, there, you know, Lesbian, I mean, God, Radcliffe Hall was really into spiritualism, wasn't she? When Una Tr 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 Trubridge got together with Radcliffe Hall, they had to go to seances and be put in touch with Radcliffe Hall's ex-girlfriend. I mean, God, it's just like so lesbian. Um, <laughs> can't even, even be on the grave. Exactly. There's no <laughs> escape from your girlfriend's ex. Um, so, but what I mean, you know what I mean, is they've, they've, spiritualism has offered something I think because of its emphasis on the spirit, it's, never, it's understandably been very appealing to people who've been, been trapped by ideas about the body. You've got the wrong kind of body to fall in love with that person with that body. But if your spirits have an affinity, well, maybe that's a different story. It was, um, I do, I'm kind of proud of Fingersmith yeah. because it's, you know, it was ambitious and I think it just about pulls it off. And it was, uh, it was a, I don't think I could write it now. I just, I, I seriously think my brain has changed. <laughs> Um, as I've got older and isn't quite up to that sort of thing anymore. And also, I'm, I'm not quite so interested in that, in that sort of melodrama, much as I love it these days. I might come back to it. Um, but it was, a, it, was just a, it was a good novel to write. And at its heart, it had this beautiful love story. Yes, I think so. Really, I think that's why. It's very romantic. It is. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I did it about the ending. I, again, I won't give too much away, but I just, when I was moored, the, the, the other main woman in it you know she's got, had such an awful upbringing and I thought I can't she can't have a happy ending it's, actually I talked to a friend about fiction about what you know what do we want from fiction and she said well I, I kind of like to see people triumphing ov over problems and mm. um, my characters in books of late haven't tended to be able to triumph over things and they get they get overwhelmed by conflict and stress and things like that so I thought with Fingersmith actually she's right it would be it would be kind of good wouldn't it so and I, I do like it I think it's nice that it, it has this um after all all the awfulness there is um a, a rise at the end of the book yeah. Yeah. your work does feel to me when I'm reading it it can be quite cinematic it, it does lend itself to adaptation uh, adapting um, yeah, like I think so. I think it's partly a generational thing. You know, I'm that age of uh, writer who grew up watching telly. You know, I, I grew up watching a lot of telly and a lot of films, and um, I think it's just that's just the way I think. And not I'm a sort of old-fashioned storyteller as well. So uh, strong characters and you know, sort of sort of clear plots and and atmosphere. Uh, you know, often I'll see a scene and, and, and write it down, sort of copy it down. So it, that inevitably lends itself to adaptation. Mm. And what was the process of adapting, you know, that first novel? Obviously, you didn't adapt it yourself, no. but did you feel very precious? Because, you know, you'd written it and, and found a publisher for it when you didn't think you would. Mm. And then someone else kind of, like, gets their hands on it. No, I didn't feel precious at all. I just felt really excited. Yeah. Um, it was just great. And, of course, it was Andrew Davis, which was tremendously... Um, it was a great honour to have, to have Andrew on board. And just kind of crazy, really, just kind of off the scale. When Sally Head, the production company, got it, got in, when they optioned it in the first place, it was exciting. And when they said they had Andrew lined up to do it, it was, it was tremendous. And then to talk to Andrew and to... You know, he, he said very clearly that... He wasn't, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do it unless the BBC kept the dildo in, you know, kept, kept. I was it going very, to ask. Yeah, very faithful to the sort of raunchiness of the book, and so just to to have him and Sally Head on side like that um, was just wonderful, you know. 
And did you imagine that they would keep all the sex in? Well, I thought it's the BBC. I know, I thought, (laughs) God, this is a great idea, but it's never going to happen. I really thought it was just a bit far-fetched. I thought that it would get it, you know, that you would get a dildo on to BBC Two at nine o'clock. And I have them there now still, I don't know. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Uh, Because it's, I watched Tipping, I mean, I've seen it many times over the years, but not for a while lately, so I watched it last week. And because it seems terribly tame now, doesn't it? Um, I mean, God, you see racier Lady Gaga videos. um, (laughs) Well, so so people tell me who know who who Lady Gaga is. But, um... But, but there, you know, it was it was very uh, quite a little event at the time. Yeah.